oh faithful God. May we always trust in you. May we put our trust in you because you are faithful and that is who you are. 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 Mana boko sendeli ya mama kiesa. Mama kie mangu mando mandi mandu mango zaya. That is who you are. That is who you are. Father, we worship you because you never change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. In all that you do, for all that you are, and concerning all that you have said, you never change, and we are thankful. Because when we are not faithful, you are always faithful. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Just before we get seated, let us read very quickly from Matthew chapter 4 verse 3. And it's not just a passage that we read, it is a passage that we pray. The word of the Lord to us is, let your heart learn to trust in me and never waver. If we submit to the Holy Spirit of God, He can teach us exactly how to trust in God and never waver. Matthew chapter 4 verse 3, the Bible says, And now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. He says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. I want you to be reminded, folks, that you and I do not have anything to prove to Satan. You and I do not have what? We don't have anything to prove to Satan. Satan is saying, if you are the son of God, I am the son of God. My father just said so. I don't have to do anything. You see, because the reason why Satan gets us to be on the road somewhere and go in the direction of the flesh is because he makes us feel like we are not enough. But the Bible says that our sufficiency is in Christ Jesus. And he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so if anybody is enough, Jesus is enough. And if my sufficiency is in him, then I am enough in him. So I do not have to take orders from Satan or any other voice. And so we're just going to pray this over our lives today that we will be confident in who we are in Christ Jesus. We will remain confident in who our Heavenly Father is. We will remain confident in who the Lord Jesus is. And we will remain confident in the power, the presence, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit. I am enough in Christ Jesus. I did not have to prove anything because the Lord has already justified me in the mighty name of Jesus. That is who he is. And this is who he has made me to be. I am an heir of salvation together with Christ Jesus. I abound in all things and all things that are good abound unto me in righteousness. Because that is who I am in Christ Jesus. Father, we give you praise for yet another opportunity to learn from your word. To be blessed and imparted in your presence with things from the treasure of your scribe, both old and new, that we may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, let's all be seated. Thank you guys, God bless you. Ooh. Hallelujah. That is who you are. Have a faithful God, that is who you are. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
God is good. Come on. Praise the Lord. I think one of these days we need to have a service wherein we just let these guys play and then we pray. I mean, look at that first five minutes of the service, you know. After you read from the account of Elijah and Elisha, I mean, I think that was perhaps the best that I've heard of y'all. I mean, y'all guys do really well with that. If you can record that and just do it again sometime, that is award winning. That was excellent. Praise God for these guys. Let's just celebrate Jesus in them. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay, so um, I have a prophetic word for y'all. And um, I know that um, it's been a lot of things going on in the world. Uh, but I want to say to you that whenever it appears that you need to hide is when you need to shine. Okay, let me just say that again very quickly because the Lord revealed to me one that was meant to be a representative of our people, of God's people. And that person was going into hiding. And guess what? Is That person that I saw was one of the witnesses because he or she, I didn't really see the face, but he or she looked like one of the witnesses because the fellow was wearing burlap. You see what I mean? That was how God describes, from God's perspective, his witnesses are meant to be dressed in sackcloth, right? If you read the book of Revelations and God was talking about his witnesses, God talks about the power with which they would come into the world. They would come in the power, the same power that Moses operated in, which is the power to plague the enemy. And we would also be present, the witnesses of the last days, in the power, the same power with which Elijah came, which was the power to, to command fire to come upon the enemy, right? And that is the reason why for so long, so many people, myself inclusive, thought the two witnesses would be Moses and Elijah. You know, but that was because we didn't continue reading after that. If you read on the same chapter, a few verses down the line, you will see a better description or a fuller description of who the witnesses are. The witnesses are the church and the nation of Israel, right? Because the Bible says they are the two olive trees that are in the presence of God. And one of the olive trees was the one that Zechariah prophesied about. He says, behold, I saw an olive tree that was already by the Lord and another one on the other side of the river. And the Lord took the one that was on the other side and he grafted the one that was on his side into the one on the other side. And both of them now became righteousness unto the Lord, a holy sanctification. And so we know that we, the Gentile nation, for the most part, are the other olive tree and the other lamp stand because Jesus revealed to us um, through the account of John the Baptist about the seven golden lampstands and the seven candlesticks that represent the seven churches and those seven churches are the candlesticks upon the golden lampstand that is the second of the two golden lampstand golden lamp stand Alrighty, so the Lord said after describing the power with which the witnesses will come into the world. Now let me say this because of the fact that if we are not constantly processing it and thinking about it and confessing and professing who we are and the power, that's like fantastic. Whatever you just did, Emmanuel, that's lovely. You know, I like to sound like an archangel. You know, because the Lord Jesus, when he spoke, the Bible says that his voice was like thunder upon many waters. And I'm supposed to be like Jesus. So if I can sound close to that with technology, I'll take it. You see, and the thing is, we need to process it, understand it, believe it, and continue to operate in it. Because we have so much power, but the world continues to say that we don't. You understand what I mean? The powerlessness of some of us against the system, inability to pay certain bills, inability to measure up in certain regards, makes us forget the things that we have ability in. You understand what I mean? It's just like if I come to Brother Matthew and I say, Brother Matthew, you have never won a Formula One race. You're not going anywhere. But God did not call him to run Formula One races. But then the world will make it seem like if you cannot do this, then you can do nothing else. And so we are so intoxicated or drugged with this inferiority complex. Whereas we are the ones with the power to make a difference. The Bible says that power was given to the witnesses. And by that same power, they can, fire comes down from, comes out of their mouths against everyone who opposes them. And also they can plague their enemies. 
Now, it's that, that is us that the Bible is talking about. But we forget. We forget that when we speak, fire comes out of our mouths. Satan doesn't want you to know. That is the reason why he wants you to continue to think that you're powerless so that you can keep quiet and that Satan can get close. But if you're speaking and professing, he cannot get close. The Lord went on to say that my witnesses will be dressed in sackcloth and ashes. And sackcloth back in the day is essentially what we call jute, what you call burlap. So just imagine somebody dressed in burlap. They don't particularly look attractive. They don't look like they are of any significance. But in reality, God would have us disguised that way so that we can continue to fulfill the similitude of Christ Jesus. And so here is the deal. I saw this fellow with a burlap garment that looked like it had been dipped in blood. It was red, but it was not bright red. It looked like it had been dipped in blood and it was dry. And this fellow was hiding. And the Lord said to me, this is not the time to hide. It looks like it, but it is the time to shine. Alrighty, that is good news. But I know that y'all, I've come to learn not to just get too excited until I explain myself. Because I know that Manuel is like, oh, that's, that's good news, right? But we never know, this man can be coming from the left field now. So the thing is, there's a reason why it will seem to many people to be a time of hiding. There will be decrees. There will be steps and moves that will be made by those who think they are in power that would want to make you not speak because it's like, well, the last time somebody said this, they disappeared. Uh, The last time somebody tried to resist this, uh, they were arrested. You know, I'm just giving you examples. Again, I want to be very clear that I'm giving examples because it's not, it may not seem that extreme, but there will be things happening in the world that will make you want to keep quiet, make you want to go into hiding. But the Lord says, it is not hiding time, it is shining time. You understand what I mean? So don't shy away from conversations, don't shy away from opportunities to let the light shine. Praise the Lord. So that was the instruction that the Holy Spirit gave to me. He said, I know that you're eager to celebrate the prophecy of Saturday. He said, but I want you to share the prophecy of today. Alrighty. So what is the prophecy of today? It may seem like a time to hide, but in reality, it is a time to shine. And thank you, Holy Spirit. You see, when we follow, you know, after him, let him take the lead. We always get to see more. And now I finally saw the face of the witness. And the witness has the face of a child. You know, there's an age that, you know, when you're still a child, maybe about seven, eight years old, if you're wearing a garment and your head is covered, it's hard to tell whether you're a boy or a girl quite often because that baby face is almost universal, right? And I saw the face of this person and it was literally glowing like it was made out of glass and there's light coming through it. And I know that when the Lord says your light has come, it has come indeed. And I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, we will see ourselves in the mirror of God's grace so that we can be confident to do what we're supposed to do. Because if you see a reflection of yourself as his witness, one with the countenance of Moses, guess what's going to happen? You will be more confident to stand tall and shine. Amen. Praise the Lord. So God is good. We're going to talk about Saturday real quick. You know, on Saturday, I stood here and I, I, I started to tell you some things that I saw. But when I saw those things, I was told not to regard them too much because they are by the way. On Saturday, what did I tell you? I said, I know the things that are coming and so do you. That the earthquakes are coming and that the Antichrist is coming. I said, but we're not moved by those things because we know who is coming, not just what is coming, right? When was that? Saturday. Was it yesterday, Monday into Tuesday, right? That we had the series of earthquakes in Turkey. Now, what many people don't know, it was when? Yeah, I'll I'll get to this somewhere else once later, but the Turkey one, when was it? Monday or Tuesday? Sunday or Monday, yeah. Okay, and watch the news. And what day was it? It, okay, so it was already Monday in Turkey, but it was Sunday night for us. Okay, so we'll just go with Monday. Alrighty. Okay. So can we just celebrate and everybody? Yeah. Absolutely. God is good. And so I was sharing with Alan, Alan earlier today. I said, um, 
I'm sure many people are, not, are unaware of the fact that most of what happened in the New Testament happened in Turkey. So the nation of Turkey now is essentially where most of the occurrences of the New Testament happened. So when you look at Paul's missionary journey, all of the trips that he made uh, from Antioch, Antioch to Macedonia to Thessalonica, every one of those places are in modern day Turkey. And all of what John the Beloved saw when he was on the island of Patmos, Patmos is also where today? In Turkey. And so God is so strategic in allowing the earthquakes to begin in Turkey. So that you know that now we're picking off, picking up from where John left off. Because John was so sure that everything that he saw was about to take place. You see what I mean? Because of how real it was. He wasn't looking into the future. He traveled into the future. When you read the revelations of John, you will see that several things that were told to him were told to him as things that must take place quickly. But the beast had not even come out of the sea 2,000 years ago when John was writing those things. But what he saw was that he saw the beast and it was coming out of the sea. And once the beast comes out of the sea, then these things must happen quickly. Alrighty. So on Saturday, what did I tell us? I said, I see the earthquakes. They're coming. And I also see the Antichrist. But the Lord Jesus said, when you see these things, Matthew 24, he says, look up. So because he's commanded us to look up, we're not looking around too much, even though we look around just to know the time to look up. Are you catching my drift? So where was the Antichrist? So I was like, okay, I know I'm supposed to be looking up, but because I just want to see the fulfillment of that prophecy, I want to see where the Antichrist is in all of that. And then I got a notification on my phone saying that Tyler shared a message in the WhatsApp group. How many people tried to click on what Tyler was saying? Did you look at the link? Well, you're lost. Maybe you can catch up with it now if they haven't taken it down. So Tyler sent a link and his caption to the link was what got my attention. He says, things are ramping up. And so I clicked on the link and there was an analyst on YouTube that was analyzing the various locations of the earthquakes. And after he spoke about the seven point something magnitude earthquake that happened in, in whatchamacallit, in, um, in Turkey, he said that there are three other earthquakes that we need to be aware of. And he says currently meteorologists are calling them the three sixes. What is the number of the beast? The number of the Antichrist, because the Bible says it is the number of a man and it is 600, two, I mean, three scores and six, which is 666. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit was like, now you should start looking up. You got what you were asking for. They were calling, and he kept repeating it. He says, they're calling them the three sixes because all three of them are six and above magnitude earthquakes. Folks, if we are still wondering what time it is, wonder no more. Because right now we need to look up. And the reason why I even remember to share that with Alan was when I called him, he said that I have seen the Lord's foot, or his feet. He says, I can see the feet of the Lord. He says, it's been revealed to me. And I'm like, yeah, he is that close. Yeah, let me say this. I'm not even sure if you thought about this. But John's revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ began with an elaborate description of the Lord's feet. He couldn't really look at his face because it was too bright. So he was looking down. Remember that as soon as he saw Jesus, he fell on his face. So when he was rising up gradually, one of the things that he was able to describe, one of the very first things that he saw was the Lord's feet. He says, behold, I see his feet and it is like burnished bronze. He said, I can see it. And so... The significance of that is this. We will begin to see a manifestation of the dominion of the Lord Jesus Christ. The feet represent dominion because he said, wherever the sole of your foot shall step, it will be given to you. The Lord Jesus is here to take this region, to take this world. As it was said in Psalms 82, it is the Lord's inheritance which he would give to his saints. So it's an amazing time that we're living in and I am excited because these prophecies have been fulfilled. 
as quickly as they are these days. Saturday, the Lord gave us the word, which would have already been Sunday in Turkey. And by Monday, just the next day, the earthquakes started. Now, I said started as opposed to happened because there will be more. And that is the order of them. The order of them is such that there will be one big one and smaller ones, one big one and smaller ones, simply because it is, um, how, do I, how do you describe this? Let me just describe it the way um, it's been shown to me lately. The little ones are not earthquakes per se, but they are triggers of several other things. They will trigger changes in weather, they will trigger plagues. Some of those earthquakes, what's really going on is that they're releasing gases into the water. Some of the waters will turn red. They're, re they're destroying the habitats. And you see what happens is when you have earthquakes like that, they kind of change the, uh, the chroma. They change the time. And when they change the time, crickets will suddenly get the notification that it's migration season. So you're going to have a plague of crickets, a plague of, of frogs. All kinds of things will begin to happen because of these triggers. What is that going to say? There were about 18 of them. Oh yeah, there were some that came here. Yeah, but those ones, they, they seemed like they were little. Oh yeah, well, yeah, black baby ones. One of them was like 3.8 magnitude. But interestingly, those are the ones to actually watch out for. You see, the big ones have already taken lives on the spot. But those little ones are releasing things into the atmosphere. And these things have been monitored from everywhere. You know, people are aware that they're going to happen. And some people actually have expected them to happen a little sooner. And so the ones who have the, um, I don't, I want to describe this without being political. You see, because there are certain people who think that they have the powers to get ahead of what things God has said. And so they've had their eyes open, trying to pinpoint where these things are gonna happen so that they can position themselves. But in reality, is their timing cannot be exact because they are not the elect. We are the only ones that has been given to to know the time, to know the season. According to First Thessalonians chapter five, I believe it was uh, when Paul, is it first or second Thessalonians? Let's, um, Rosemary, which one is it? When Paul was talking about the fact that to the unbelievers, to the, to the children of disobedience, the coming of the Lord will be as a thief in the night, but to you it will not be, and I needn't tell you because you will know your season. First or second Thessalonians? First, okay. First Thessalonians chapter five, it says that to those people outside, the coming of the Lord will be as a thief in the night, but to those of you that I am speaking to, Paul says, I don't even need to tell you because you already know. And I have taught extensively around that particular chapter of the Bible that that chapter of the Bible was not written when Paul was alive, even though it was written by Paul. Paul was taken into the future and he wrote that from the perspective of the end time believers. So when he was writing, he was writing to us. Everything that he wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter five was to us. Remember, he says, pray without season because he saw that people were getting faint hearted. And faint heartedness is one of the plagues of our times, which Jesus addressed in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, when he says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Look at how faint hearted we are if we're careless or that we can be because there's so much pressure on us, so much pressure from government, from social media platforms, from, from children, from just about anywhere you can imagine. We are pressed on every side. There's never really been a generation, according to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 12, that is as troubled as the generation of today. I always like to give people this as, this example. If you can go back in time 30 years, then you will realize how bad things have become. But it's just like we're frogs in the pot. We got used to the rising temperature in, in world temperature, and I'm not talking about global warming, I'm talking about the adversities, and I'm talking about the intensity of events, right? Because remember, about 30 years ago, your kid can leave the house and ride their bicycles to the end of the world and come back, and all you worry about is if they've eaten. But these days you worry about them not being eaten. You understand what I mean? You know a lot of things that we used to do, you never, you never used to take the key out of your car, you just park it and then you walk away. If you try that now, it's not just the car that will disappear, you too will disappear. Oh yeah, I remember once a guy's car was stolen in front of one of our businesses many years ago. And not only did the car disappear, himself disappeared, he dived into the, the, the culvert. He went into the gutter. 
you know, the side drainage on the road, he was looking for his car under the COVID. That kind of confusion is what happens in the world today because people think about all of the trouble. So when there's a little trouble, it just makes everything seem bigger than it really is. Have you, have you ever been served a notice of maybe $30 and then you just cry? But it's not the $30, it's the fact that everything else is like, I can't take this anymore. You understand what I mean? You, you, you know what I'm talking about? And so it is not just what they take from you, it is what you have given up yourself in the name of worry and care. But only 30 years ago, that was how safe the world was. You know, 30 years ago, you can actually almost vote somebody into office. But try that today. I'm here. I'm waiting. Try and vote somebody into office and let me see you. You understand what I mean? The system has become so corrupt and hijacked that you, you don't even know what is what anymore. The Bible says that the time will come wherein that which is evil, men will call it good and that which is good, they will call it evil. And the ones who are supposed to be the learned ones amongst them in the, in the epistles of Timothy, of Paul to Timothy, what did he say? He says the so-called learned ones will begin to push as science what is not even knowledge. They will try to convince you that that is science, but in reality it's not even knowledge. It's not even sound knowledge but they want to tell you that that's the science of the day. So those are the times that we're living in. So I want to encourage you, when things like this begin to occur, as the Lord has said, what do you do? You look up. I'm going to tell you three ways very quickly by which you look up. Okay, because many people think looking up is just going to stand outside at night and be looking up. That's part of it. Okay, so don't be dismissive of people who spend time outside these days looking out. You see, because the way you are wired as a human being, you know what you're seeing even when you don't know what you're seeing. The Bible says that eternity has been written into the hearts of men. The Bible says from the visible elements of this world, we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God and of eternal powers. Right? So what are the attributes of God that you want to know about in these days? You want to know his entry attributes. How does he enter when he says he is coming? And how do you know those attributes? By looking up. Remember the wise men who had schooled in the doctrines of Daniel when they came from the east, from the order of the Chaldeans. What did they say? They said a king is being born because we have seen his star in the east. These guys were looking up and it guided them to that particular place. It is not just an Old Testament phenomenon. It is still happening today. If it was just an Old Testament phenomenon, Jesus would not have recommended it to the saints that will be alive when he comes. Remember that there was one day Jesus was prophesying and he was taken from the time that he was to the end of days. And it says, of them standing before me today, some will be here when I return. He was talking about people that were physically present, alive when he comes back. And he said to them that when you see the sun turn black and the moon turn into blood, he says, then you know that your redemption draws near. And so if I'm going to see it, then I should be looking for it. So one of the ways by which we look up is what? Is we look up by physically, literally going outside and looking up. You don't have to worry about the astrology and the, you see, because astrology is so deep that the people who truly understood it in the past, Alan is laughing because he's read books and stuff and that thing is still kind of magical or mystical. But I tell you, when you look at what Job said, Job said, the Lord taught me the order of the stars. And he was supposed to be the wealthiest man in the East and one of the wisest men. In fact, some of the recent findings that is reaching us is actually suggesting that Job was one of the advisors of Pharaoh and that was how he made his money. So this was a smart guy. He was not just your regular Job. But when it comes to the stars, he says, the Lord taught me. When you read the accounts of Enoch, there was no way Enoch could have understood the radial order of the sun, of the moon, if the angel of the Lord had not taken him. And there was one day Enoch was sitting under the tutelage of the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord, after telling Enoch about the sun, the moon, and the stars, Enoch's mouth was open and he couldn't close it. And the angel was like, uh, you didn't get that, did you? He said, not a single thing. He says, I will write it down for you. Some of the journals of Enoch was written in the handwriting of the angel of the Lord. 
Because after they gave him a lecture, the guy had no clue what they were talking about. He was looking, and they were looking at him, and the angel of the Lord was like, son of man, you have no understanding of that which you see. And he says, not a thing. And they said, we will write it down for you. They actually wrote it for him. Hopefully, maybe when he read it and read it and read it again, he would get it. And let me tell you something, I have read it and read it and read it, and I haven't totally gotten it. You understand what I mean? But when it comes to the stars, it takes divine tuition for us to understand it. But it is not where we are now. We have a thousand years to catch up on some of these things. But one thing that we do know is that there is an activator on the inside of us that has an understanding of what the Lord is showing. And all I have to do is use these eyes to feed that into my spirit and let my spirit do the guiding. Let me say that again. When I look at things, it goes into my soul and then it makes it into my spirit. And when it gets into my spirit, because the Bible says what man knows the things of man, save the spirit of man. That is King James English. What it means in normal English is that the part of man that knows the deep things of a man is the spirit of a man. Not his brain, not his mind, but his spirit. Just as the spirit of God knows the things of God, even the thoughts of his heart. The Holy Spirit knows what the Father is thinking. Right? He knows the things that the Father hasn't expressed yet as a thought. Now, let me explain that because that can be a little deep. You see, by the nature of God, there are certain things that... So, most of us, before we speak, at least ideally, we have to think. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That was like an old... It's almost like a lost art. Most people today, they don't think. They just type. They call them trolls. They just type. <laughs> And then, you know, I'm sure if we wouldn't, them, you can't be that dumb. Some people online, I almost want to message them and say, can you just read your comment again and let your own brain speak to you? You see what I mean? But in reality, by nature, we think, we speak, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. However, when it comes to God, there are certain times that God has not even stirred it up as a thought, but it is just his nature to communicate certain things. Can I, can I prove that to you? When God was trying to lecture, and I shared this on Friday, maybe two Fridays ago, when people were asking about uh, the difference between a seer and a prophet. When God was trying to educate Miriam and Aaron on the distinction of the office of Moses, one of the things he said to them, because this was what happened, Miriam and Aaron were beginning to feel like they had arrived in ministry because they too were prophesying. You know, you can prophesy and not be a prophet. Because prophesying just has to do with any manifestation of a spiritual gift that is by reason of the unction of the Holy Spirit. And so some people sing and they're prophesying. Some people just advise you and they're prophesying because they're speaking a word of wisdom or speaking word of knowledge. All those mouth gifts are prophecy gifts. But the office of the prophet is a different ball game. And so when, when Aaron and Miriam were like, we can say whatever we want. They were talking about Moses marrying outside of their race. They, don't, they didn't like the fact that Moses went to marry a woman of the Midianites. And so when they were running their mouths, even they themselves, their conscience was telling them, you're doing too much. And so Miriam was like, we're not doing too much. We also prophesy, we can say whatever we want. The Bible says once they said that, leprosy came upon Miriam. Just as a way of saying, okay, I don't want to kill you, but I want to teach you a lesson. You understand what I mean? So there are certain times that God allows certain things to happen to us because he loves us. All righty? Because you could have just died. Because God already warned them, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. So they had already violated and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So she could have actually literally died. But God allowed only her body to die because leprosy is essentially the death of yourselves. Right? And so when God saw what had happened, he knew that Moses was a little concerned because those were his siblings. So God came in and he said, okay, I, I want to have a meeting. All three of you, meet me outside. Which is interesting, you know, because when God says, meet me outside, be thankful. Just be rolling on the floor and say, thank you. Because if he comes to meet you inside, it's not the same story. Anyway, let's not get into that. So God told them to meet him outside. When they met him outside, he said to them, he says, you know, there are some of you who prophesy. Because I show them visions. I give them dreams. So they see and they speak. What do you call people like that? You call them seers. You know, so in the Hebrew language, it's not the same word that is used to describe seers and prophets. 
One of them is, is Nabu, which is to see. That was why Moses died on the Mount of Nabu because the Lord told him to go there that he might see. But, and then the other one, I can't remember what it is, but they're two different words, all right? And so God said to them, those of you who see to speak as seers, do not compare yourself to this one because I called him and raised him to be a prophet. He said, because not only does he know the things that I think and say, he says he even can prophesy based on the posture of his God. God says, Moses can prophesy based on my form. Just the way that God stands alone, Moses is like, I got you. I know exactly what you have said. You don't even have to say it. You understand what I mean? How did we get into all of that again? Okay, praise the Lord. But let's just go back to this concept of looking at the stars. And then by looking at the stars, feeding them into your eyes, your spirit will know what to do. Now, there's something about the human spirit. The human spirit, the born again human spirit is very efficient and it has a lot of responsibilities, all right? Romans chapter eight, verse 26 says, likewise, the spirit helps us in all our infirmities for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit makes intercessions for us with groanings that can't be uttered. So your spirit is always at alert, watching out for you. And so because it is tasked with a lot of responsibilities, this born again spirit that is on the inside of you, which looks just like the Lord Jesus, is a very busy person, so it has to be efficient. And you know one of the things that it does? It doesn't tell you things that you don't need to know. Eternity is written in my heart where my spirit resides. My spirit can read what's written on the walls of my heart. But then I don't know everything that is in eternity. Because if everything in eternity were to be downloaded to my brain as I am right now, you may not like what's going to happen. You understand what I mean? There, there could be an explosion, right? Because all that information is meant for the new body when we receive it. Does it make sense? And so your spirit does not have to necessarily tell you all of what it's deducing from the signs and the stars. But then if you are being led by that spirit, guess what's going to happen? There are things that you will avoid. There are people whose numbers you will delete. There are people whose phones you will not answer. There are places that you will not go to. There are things that you will save. There are things that you will dispose of because that's what God expects of his sons to be led. The Bible says as many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. You see, we have the Holy Spirit that has been poured upon all flesh, energizing the spirit and birthing the spirit that is on the inside of you. But that spirit that is on the inside of you is what God expects you to be led by. But you need to play your part in making the spirit know what you are ready for. So what do you do? You look up by literally looking up and let your spirit make of it what it would. You understand what I mean? Does that make sense? And I say that because I don't want you to be discouraged when you look outside and you're like, which one of these constellations is Virgo? Oh, can't be bothered. No, God knows where we're at. You understand what I mean? He, and he's working with us. All right? That doesn't mean we should be lazy though. If you have an opportunity to study, study. If you have an opportunity to ask questions, ask questions because the Bible says he knows who follows to know, who seeks to know. The other way to look up is in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. I believe that's what it is. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Second epistle of Timothy chapter 1. It says, the Lord grant to me, one, one quick second here. Let me read it from this translation here. Alrighty. So 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 16, it says, The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. That might not even be how they say it. It looks like one Siphorus. Yeah, we'll go with one side for us today. That sounds better. For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. The Bible says the Lord grants to what? Mercy to the household of one side for us 
because he always refreshed me. He remembers me even when I am in my chain. Now, let me tell you something about the, the household of Onesiphorus or one side for us. This was a person who appreciated the ministry of the ones who have been sent as scribes to teach the things of God. So one of the ways by which we look up is to look up the things that have already been written. Does it make sense? There is a blessing that comes upon the ones who remembers. Now, let me, let me tell you the way the Lord showed this to me. You see, when Paul was in prison, he will write things and he will keep them until his agents come to retrieve it. Because a lot of those things were smuggled out of prison. A lot of the epistles that we're, read, that we're reading were smuggled out because if the guards were able to see what he was writing, there were times when he wrote against the people that were in power. It may not have made it out, right? And so those things were there and they were covered up and that picture is associated with the man of God being in chains. But when you remember to check up on or to look up on the things that they paid so dearly for, it opens your mind. So if you are going to enjoy the blessing and the name one side for us or Onisiparos, it means the one that has been equipped to not lose, literally, but in the implied meaning is the profitable one, right? So we have been equipped to be profitable because God has safeguarded us against losses. And how did he do that? By allowing those who have come before us to write things that we can look up. What did the Bible say about scriptures that have been written down? The Bible says that these scriptures have been given for what? For your profit. Because God is seeing you as one side for us, the one that must be profitable. So they gave you things that you can look up. So we go outside to look at the stars, but we also make reference particularly to the things that were written while these boys were in chains. One of the most amazing books about the end times is the book of Revelations. When it was written, where was John? John was not a free man when it was written. He was actually imprisoned on the island of Patmos. He was an old man, so they didn't consider him much of a threat. He wasn't about to jump into the water and swim to the next island. So it was a cheap kind of prison. Because back in the day, people that were in prison on islands and in the open, they were easier to maintain because you didn't have to give them medicines and ointments as much. The ones you put in concrete or in, in stone dungeons, there's a lot of maintenance because you have to give them oils because they're not getting fresh air so they get sick and all of that. So if you can afford it, put them on an island as long as you know they can't escape. You understand what I mean? And so, he, so when you read the island of Patmos, don't think he was on vacation. He was not on vacation. He was a prisoner on the island of Patmos. And yet the things that he wrote. Now let me tell you this. I mentioned this briefly on Saturday. Some of the most amazing revelations that we have came from people that were in prison. We love Jeremiah, don't we? A lot of what Jeremiah wrote, he wrote while he was in prison. He was a political prisoner. A lot of what Isaiah wrote, Isaiah wrote, or at least he received the revelation of when he was a prisoner. Whose prisoner was he? He was a prisoner of God. God allowed for him to be imprisoned for two years in his own mind. He was a lunatic for two years. And so there is something about what is being written while men are in chains that we need to look up because it speaks concerning the times that we're in. The third way to look up is to look up in your spirit to the Lord for sustenance. Let me explain this one. You see, many of us, when we are in crisis, we are accustomed to looking around to seeing what we can do, right? If you look around well enough, you will find things. You will find a credit card that you have not used. You will find a bank that you have not gone to. You will find somebody that you haven't borrowed money from in a long time and you'll be like, okay, now I remember this guy. So if you look around enough, you will get some version of help, but it is not the help that you need because the help that you need comes from where? Comes from above. So when Jesus says, when you see these things, what do you do? He says, look up because your redemption is nigh. He's not saying that so that you can just park your destiny in a garage and be waiting for Jesus to come. It's because of the fact that everything that you need to fulfill destiny that has yet to be released will be released because your redemption is near. I pray that you get what I just said. 
God has said to you and I that we are without excuse. So if you can think about all of the things that God has said that you will do in his name, the greater works, they still have to happen because Jesus did not leave any stones unturned. You know what he said? When someone was trying to distract him, he said, no, 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 we're not doing that today. He says, I must work the work of him who has sent me while it is day for the night comes when no man can work. So before the night came, Jesus finished all of his assignment. And that was why on the cross, before the darkness fell, the last thing Jesus said before the darkness fell was what? It is finished. And then he says, Lord, into your hand I commit my spirit. But he said, it is finished. And afterwards, the Bible says, darkness fell upon the earth, such as have never been seen. Had never been seen. So that darkness that came when Jesus was on the cross, like I told you on Saturday, was the same darkness that God separated from the light in Genesis. He called the, the, the light day and the night, the darkness he called night. That night is coming back. Is the night with a capital N. And so when Jesus says, look up when you see these things, because the night is coming, that means there is no equipping that you need that will not be made available to you. Many of us are about to receive resources that can last a man a lifetime. You, you're about to receive it in one day. Because God will not be found lying. Neither will he be found at a loss. You are his investment. The Bible says that you are the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. The currency of heaven is glory. And so if God is going to make a profit from this investment that he made in Matthew, then Matthew needs to receive the light with which he can shine the glory. And so everything that God has invested in you, God needs to get it out. So you do not have an excuse because everything is being made available. Remember, you are one Sipphoros, the one that has been equipped to prosper and to make profit because God has made you immune to loss. And so if God says that I have to go to 64 countries before the Lord Jesus comes, then I would have to receive the resources to be able to go to those 64 countries. Some of those resources will be natural and some of them will be supernatural. I will just wake up and show up in places and they'll be like, how did you get here? It doesn't matter. I am here right now. You must be born again. Remember Philip. Philip was walking. That was a natural occurrence. And he was walking and he was walking alongside in fact, the other day I asked the Holy Spirit, I was like, I think I know the reason why Philip found the eunuch. And you know the reason? Philip, his name means the lover of horses. So his fascination was probably with this guy's Ethiopian horse. Because those people had some horses back in the day. Remember that Solomon used to import horses from the region of Ethiopia. Generally, they call that place Misriam, which covers from Egypt all the way down to Somalia. Everything in that region, they had some of the best horses. Solomon, in his splendor, he would insist on riding holy horses that came from that region. And so when the Ethiopian eunuch came, Philip could not resist the horse. The Bible says he was walking alongside with the man. The man was in his chariot and Philip was like, oh my God, I have the gospel to preach, but this horse, which is like some, somebody that I know in here, he cannot take his eyes off of a beautiful car. I'm not going to tell you who that is, but pray for him. Philip was a lover of horses and he was working with the Ethiopian eunuch. But guess what? He left where he was supposed to be going originally. But God did not mind because that was an assignment for him to fulfill as well. And the Bible says that as soon as he was done dunking the Ethiopian eunuch in the water and the men came out of the water and gave glory to God, Philip was caught up in the spirit and he appeared in another place. That's where the expression came from, Philip's ticket. And so whether it is natural financial, emotional, or spiritual, every equipping that you need is coming, but you have to look up to receive it. Because David says, I will lift up my head to the hills from whence come my help. And so there are three look up requirements. Look at the stars. Okay, look at them often. Because if you're you, if you in your house, the news will not show you what you need to see because they don't even want you to know your season. So you have to go outside and look at the stars because God is not going to be found what? A liar. And you will not be found with any legal excuses. The Bible says you are inexcusable. 
Because it doesn't take money to look at the skies. It's one of the freest things in the world. Anybody can go out and look at the sky. In fact, the poorest people in the world are the ones who see the brightest sky. Think about it. The poorest people in the world are the ones who see the brightest sky because those of us who are in the West, we're so rich that everywhere we turn, what do we see? Lights everywhere. And these artificial lights keep you from seeing the, the spiritual lights because of the fact that they cause so much glare. You understand what I mean? If you truly want to see the sky, you have to go to a place that hasn't been developed at all, that has no glare, that has nothing, and then you will begin to see stars that you did not even know existed. So what is your excuse? These things are free. Look up often and then look up the things that were written by those who were in chains because a particular kind of mercy is given so that they can fulfill their name as profitable servants, as one Cyphorus. Let me go back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 3 that we read, and then we're going to wrap up. You see, one of the things that I find most exciting about the season that we're in is because we have all suddenly become time travelers. Because we're living in a time, in a season, where time itself has been sped up. Now, to the unsuspecting civilian who does not know that there are soldiers in the army of God, when I said unsuspecting civilian, uh, what's his name? Charles, he likes that, you know? Because those of us here, he sees us as civilians. No, we're also soldiers in the army of the Lord. The unsuspecting civilian, time will pass and they would not have accomplished anything because God does not want their work. The Bible says even the prayer of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. And his sacrifices, what are they? Also an abomination. So time will pass and they would not have done anything. But for those of us who continue to commit to doing the will of God, we will get a lot done in his name within the short period of time that we have. Don't worry if you don't think that you have made such an impact on other people. What you don't have, you cannot give. A lot of us were still in that season wherein all this time that is being sped up and all the acceleration that is going on is primarily for the acceleration of your growth and understanding of spiritual things. Because we, the, what we know now, even Brother Matthew can attest, the things we know now, we didn't know them five years ago. Even just five years ago, this, a lot of the numbers in, in prophecy did not make any sense to us. Five years ago, did we know that Isaiah 45 was a prophecy to the church? Many of us thought that it was a prophecy to President Donald Trump. Simply because we were like, man, dude, this guy's coming from the business world with all that money and he's going to help the church just like Cyrus was coming from all that power and he helped God's people. So we thought it was, but then in reality, when we looked at it again, we were like, wait a minute. Cyrus means the church. The literal meaning of Cyrus is the ones that possess the furnace. And what is that? It's a code name for the church. Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You will, pro what? You will possess the gates of your enemies. What is the gate of the enemy? The gate of hell, the furnace. And we are the possessors thereof. The moment that hits you, then you begin to see that God is ultimately in the process of delivering us from the monetary system. That is what mostly the Isaiah 45 is about. Delivering us from the monetary system so that we can be truly free to do the will of our Heavenly Father without being constrained by money that we do not control. Anyway, story for another day, but what I'm saying is, Time that is being sped up has allowed for us to receive such an understanding that we did not have before. But what do we do now? We need to continue to look up because there is more. Matthew chapter 4 verse 3. I want to visit this scripture again because it be, I believe it's going to help many of us to be able to act, activate what God gave to us on Saturday. How many people have heard Saturday's message? If you were here, that means you heard it. But if you weren't here and you haven't gone to listen to it, I encourage you to go and listen to it because it was literally, um, uh, what's the word? I almost wanted to say that a shift, but the shift happened Tuesday last week. Saturday was more of a, a, a distinction. God gave us a distinction so that we can quit operating as grasshoppers 
in their sight, wherein in fact we are able to possess the land. So look at what verse 3 says. It says, now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. We're going to break bread and this is what we're going to confess and profess as we break bread. Jesus said, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. Who was Jesus? Jesus was the son of man, son of God. And Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Technically, Jesus wants you, wants you and I to always remember that we are sons of God. Because every time you remember that you're a son of God, you comport yourself as you should. There are certain things that are beneath sons of God. There are certain things that as a son of God, you must not be caught doing. Can I give you an example? Worrying. Being fearful. You see, because when we were growing up, all they want us against were things that we have already been forgiven of. They want us, oh, you can't steal. You can't lie. You can't backbite. You can't gossip. Okay, I get it. But what about the weightier matters of the law? The things that actually affect the kingdom of God that is on the inside of you. The kingdom of God that is on the inside of you. The Bible says it is not in meat. It is not in drink. But it is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And worry is one arrow that can penetrate all three of them. Because when you start to worry... It negates your divine identity. The Bible says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So the moment you begin to worry, that means you no longer believe that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because if you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, then that means everything is right with you. And then the moment you start to worry, you lose your peace. And when you don't have peace and you pretend to be joyful, you're only lying. Which is what everybody does when they go drinking to forget their sorrows. You have no peace. And the Bible says the one, the one who is sorrowful, who goes to drink, mixed drinks, will only wake up with more sorrow. You understand what I mean? And so you, you don't have peace and you want to claim joy. You see how deadly worry is? I mean, for crying out loud, why should you worry if your heavenly father owns a cattle upon a thousand hills? Even Bill Gates does not have a thousand hills. And if he does, they don't have cattle on them. You see, a cattle upon a thousand hills. And usually when the Bible says a thousand, you know what a thousand meant to the people of old? A thousand means when they get tired of counting. So most times when they say a thousand, it's not a thousand. It's more than a thousand. It's just like, I got to a thousand and I'm done. I don't even have numbers. Can I tell you how I found out? If you look at the Roman figure, what is the Roman numeral or the Roman letter for a thousand? My wife is like, I'm not sure about this one, but I'm going to whisper it anyway. She was like, mm. Mm. Oh yeah, because most times when you don't know what to say, you say, mm. Anyway, that was a fable, but you get it. So, let me close this Bible. If your heavenly father is who he says he is, and you believe it, then certain things should become beneath you. So Jesus said, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. Because to remember him is to remember who you are because you are in him. You understand what I mean? And so the biggest problem that we're facing today is forgetfulness. We forget who we are. And Satan came to Jesus to see if Jesus had forgotten if he was truly the son of God. He says, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. No, I haven't forgotten. I'm still the son of God and I don't have to prove it to you. That was the sin of Adam and Eve. The Bible says in the day that they were made, the, ones who, the one who made them, made them male and female in the image and in the likeness of him. God already made them in the image and the like, in his own image and in his likeness. And so if I make you in my image and in my likeness and also gave you dominion, then basically I have made you a God on the earth. And Satan came and he was like, you want to be like God? Eat this fruit. They were supposed to say, I don't want to be like God. I am already like God. Go, go get busy, Satan. Go find something to do. 
You understand what I mean? That was what they were supposed to say. They were supposed to send him packing. Go find something to do. Remember when Satan showed up when God was having a meeting with his sons and God asked him, what are you doing? He says, not much. I'm just running to and fro. God gave him something to do. You see what I mean? But Adam and Eve, they were like, oh my God, we can be like God. Do you know how many of us every day we're thinking, oh my God, so if I do that, I can be rich? Oh, if I did that, I can be rich? But the Bible says you are rich. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, he says, no, they say you are poor. He says, I say that you are rich. You understand what I mean? Who says you are poor? Satan and the world system. So that you can focus on the wrong things. But when you begin to think that you're a son of God and you're rich, you will begin to focus more on getting things done rather than getting what you need to do things. You already have what you need. Please, I want you to get that. Everything that you need has already been dispersed by heaven. Hit the ground and see if the providence will not meet you on the way. Anyway, let's, let, let me just tell you this example. You see, when we came to America, one of the things that we desired was we desired that we would be able to host people in our house. We were staying in a two-bedroom apartment, okay? So look at that kind of faith. It was what, like 1,100 square feet or even, yeah, about 1,147 square feet. And we were like, okay, where's the money going to come from to buy a house that is big enough? And the Lord was like, okay, why do you want a big house? We said, we want to put people there. He said, how many people do you have now that want to even come and fellowship with the two of you? We said one, and that was Joshua. And was like, okay, why don't you start where you're at, right? And so, you know, we started inviting people. Even my own cousin did not come, and they lived behind our house. One of, if I, the most devastating thing was one day, we finished having fellowship, all three of us, and we went outside, and my cousin and his wife were strolling in front of our house. They didn't even come to the fellowship. And God was like, how many rooms did you say you want again? I'm like, don't worry about it. We're not ready. But guess what? We started where we were at. From there, God gave us a three-bedroom house. And the total capacity of that living room was 20 people. The day we had 22 people, two of them sat in the kitchen. You understand what I mean? But guess what? We didn't wait for the resources to come before we hit the ground. We hit the ground and the resources kept coming along the way. If God gives you a vehicle that is too big for you, you can actually enjoy yourself while the vehicle is moving because you're just going to be bouncing from side to side. So he wants you to grow in it. So what I am saying to you is this. God keeps showing you this house that is going to be yours in his name for his glory, but you're waiting for all the money to come before you start looking. I told you the story the other day when my wife and I started looking we went to certain neighborhoods and certain places and one of the realtors said to us, he was like, are you sure you want to come to a place like this? I said, yeah, we want to. So he asked me, I will never forget. That was the one that my wife was referring to, but I thought she was talking about the realtor who came to our living room. But now I remember, he said, where is the money coming from? And I looked at him and I felt insulted. Before My flesh wanted to tell him, how dare you? But I knew that that was my opportunity to witness. So I said to him, I said, oh, don't worry about it. My father will send it. And he thought I was an African prince, that some money was coming from somewhere. The way I said my father will send it. Yeah, because what, let me tell you something. Moments like that are an opportunity for you to declare the word of God because my own words did not carry any weight at that time because if you don't have money, you're just talking. The Bible says even the rich man has many friends because he has substance. But if you don't have substance, just shut up or speak the word of God. Don't wait move. Let's do this in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. So we're going to eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him so that once we are fully reminded of who we are, then nobody, ain't nobody can convince you to prove what God has already proven. Because the devil will want to make you to fend for yourself. The devil wants you, to, wants you to fear for your life in the name of taking responsibility in the crazy world that we're in. But you need to remind him that you are already looked after because you are the apple of God's eyes. These things have to believe. They have to go into your spirit. You need to believe it 
so that you can start to live that abundance, that divine life of providence, that divine life that is equipped. You have to believe what God has said about you when you look up the prophecies of those who were in chains that you may be Onesiphorus, one that is profitable. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, may we remember who we are in Christ. In Jesus' name, you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. Praise the Lord. God is good. The Bible says, and I say to you again, you shall lay your hand on the sick and they shall recover. It doesn't matter how many times you've done it before, you just keep doing it. The Lord reminded me lately of something that I want to share with you and I'm going to get off this stage. He said to me, do you know how many times the apostles and the others came to the upper room and nothing happened. Can I say that again? You know, we always like to think about the fact that Jesus went to the, he went on the mountain of olives. Was it the Mount of Olives where he ascended to heaven from? Yeah, because he's coming back on that same mountain. So Jesus was on the Mount of Olives and the, the men in linen who were the witnesses, I think that, was, that were prophesied by Isaiah, who would be the witnesses in white linen, who would declare the good news. The Bible says, how beautiful upon the mountains, the feet of them that bring glad tidings. He was talking about those two angels who were standing on the Mount of Olives, who brought the good news. And what was the good news? The same way you see him leave is the way that he will arrive because that's what keeps us here that he's coming back right and so when those angels declared many times we like to think that they just came down from that mountain went to the upper room and the holy spirit came no they waited many many days several weeks passed i think it was a total of about what 40 days or so before the day of pentecost was fully come the people that saw the angels speak to them there were the same 500 people who saw Jesus taken up in the clouds. But when the day of Pentecost came, how many people were left? 120. Think about it. Where did the rest go? After like one week, they're like, yeah, we keep coming to this upper room. Nothing happens. After like two weeks, more people stopped coming. Three weeks, even more. By the time it was the day of Pentecost, they were down only to the 120 people who had nowhere else to go. So don't be dismayed by how many times you have laid your hands on yourself or laid hands on other people. Just keep showing up and doing what he says. If you do it consistently enough, when the time comes, you will see what he said. So what the Lord said to me just now to tell you, you shall lay your hand upon the sick and they shall recover. Delete all the times that it did not happen from your memory and continue to believe that you will lay your hands on the sick and they will recover because all it takes is just for the day of Pentecost to fully come and then you become a superstar. Not so that you can make money, but so that he can get glory. You understand what I mean? So I want to encourage you. It's an express word from the Lord and I want you to take it to heart. You, even you, will lay your hand on the sick and they shall recover. God bless you. We'll see you Saturday. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Let's get ready to worship in our giving. If I, my brother Charles will help us with the uh, offering slide there at the bottom. I'm not going to hold us here. Uh, how, how many have been declaring the word? Come on, somebody. The Lord has just been giving us uh, gems, reminding us as the man of God uh, shared with us of, of his word. And uh, what a, a, a picture that was illustrated before us on that fire that comes from our mouth that keeps the enemy away when we declare the word. So let's ensure that we are doing that as we've been encouraged. The given details are here. We'll take just a couple of seconds to prepare our offering and we will give God praise. Father, we thank you for this time, this season that you have brought us into by your Holy Spirit leading us into all truth. We say we love you, O oh God. We thank you for 
your presence, O God, your anointing that rests upon us, O God. Lord, your word declares that you give seed to the sower. And Father, we give you praise for every seed that you have given us, O God, for we know it all belongs to you, for you indeed own the cattle on a thousand hills, O God. Let these offerings unto you be pleasing in your sight. Lord, we thank you that you bring us into the resources, O God, to implement your kingdom as we await your appearing in the sky, O God. Look upon these and be pleased. And we declare that all glory and honor belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Hallelujah. Don't forget, we'll be back at it tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Instagram, second watch. We're going to pray. We're going to pray and we're going to pray. Come on, give somebody... Uh, um, Give somebody the uh, information, forward it to somebody. We've had a lot of folk tapping in on the Instagram live. So uh, we just want to continue to encourage that because we know the presence of God has really just been showing up strong in our households, just really igniting uh, that fire, okay, that altar. All righty. Father, we thank you for this time of meeting, how you have kept us, oh God. Keep us as we go to and fro back to our homes. Command your angels to take charge over us. All glory belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Everyone have a blessed night.